I was in Australia last week with a couple Singaporean colleagues and they were fascinated by the idea of protesters, which I thought as an American is hilarious. Like, I really hope you can edit in the Viking guy taking over the Capitol building. Meet Blake, an American who exchanged New York for Singapore and has been living here for 11 years. He works in the event industry, bringing Broadway shows, A-list concerts and major sport events to Singapore. We discuss what he misses about the US, what America can learn from Singapore and key insights for Westerners about Asia. I'm Max, entrepreneur and YouTuber from Singapore. Let's go for it. Let's talk a bit about like daily life in New York and Singapore. Public transportation, I don't even think we can talk about. New York sucks. New York, so, New York subway There are so many so crazy worst. videos from yeah. New York subway. I love it. I would love if Singapore would introduce a culture around uh, train car performers like <laughs> New York has, right? Yes. Unfortunately, in New York, it's kind of by necessity. Yeah. Uh, in Singapore, I feel like we could just ignite that as an art form, which I think would be super cool. Similarly, yeah. city to city, um, the diversity by neighborhood is really quite an interesting dynamic, right? Um, Singapore, New York, I mean, almost every major city in the world has a Chinatown. Singapore has, just like New York, has a lot of districts. You know, a lot of places, I think about Melbourne, definitely has districts, but a lot more intertwined. Um, whereas I find New York and Singapore to be really segmented um, with, their, with their districts. What about cost of living? Insane. Is that, I mean, both, both, both places. Both. Both places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are they, one, two, two, one? I mean, every year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything's expensive. But, um, you know, one thing I love about Singapore, and, and genuinely, this is something that I've been able to reflect on as we've been able to have social gatherings again, is um, the incredible people you meet. This, this market, while transient, also is um, designed to bring the greatest talent to one place, and it's a small place. And so the, the likelihood that you're engaged in conversations with people from top of their fields is really, is really not an uncommon occurrence. And I kind of like that. It's intellectually stimulating. It's intimidating. You have to get comfortable with the idea that you don't know a lot about a lot of subjects. But you have to also learn how to ask questions, talk to people, and you better yourself for that. What's the biggest like, differences and similarities, let's say, New York and Singapore. The cost of a deli sandwich. <laughs> no, but seriously, the deli sandwich always resonates with me because I love a Reuben and it's like 20 bucks in New York and impossible to find in Singapore. On a much deeper level, um, I think arts, arts and culture are something that, that, that inter intertwines societies. I think, uh, look, I work in live entertainment. And so for me, the first thing I always notice about a society is their ability to tell stories. Uh, through a lot of different platforms, whether that's live theater, sports. Um, I'm very connected to the emotional aspect. Asian culture in general, not just in Singapore, but China, Vietnam, Thailand, they have really rich storytelling cultures. I always connect with the entertainment aspects of culture, whether it's local community theater or yeah. major, you know, Broadway style. Actually, guys, if you want to watch more videos about the U.S. compared to Singapore, that's the video that we shoot recently and also subscribe to the channel, don't forget. Do you have any difficulties to make Singaporean friends, like locals? No, not really. I definitely find that there's cultural differences, particularly in humor. Tell me about that. I have a, well, I have a fairly <laughs> sarcastic and dry sense of humor. I'm also very excitable. I think sometimes the energy that I can give off might be a little overwhelming, might be taken as aggression or um, maybe egotistical. Sometimes I have to remind myself to scale back. Uh, I was always told in Australia when I was living there to be a little less American, which I thought was funny. Good way to put it. What would be your advice? How to feel good and how to be relatable here in, in, on this market? Well, I think one thing that I've learned over the years is watching American media um, shapes a perception of what it is to be American. I remember when I moved to London the first time, I had somebody say, oh, I thought all Americans were fat. And I was like, well, I might have a dad, I might have a dad bod now, but <laughs> Uh, you know, at the time I was probably 140 pounds and I was a twig. And so I thought that was weird. And then I moved to Australia and the guy said, uh, do you own a gun? I'm like, no, I don't own a gun. Like, I know we have a lot of guns, but I don't own a gun. He's like, everybody owns a gun. I'm like, no, not everybody owns a gun. Quite entertaining about some of the, some of the misconceptions you can have. What I would say to somebody moving to Singapore is um, be open-minded to how people may interpret your culture. Um, and also be appreciative and understanding that uh, you don't necessarily understand their culture as well. So I think it's very important for people to take time to uh, get, get to know one another, take time to ask questions, go to a, and experience things together. I think anytime you can go to a Chinese New Year dinner or you can go to uh, celebrate Hari Raya or Diwali or any of these cultural experiences that um, you, you may have never come across before, go, learn, understand. One thing that COVID 
helped me self-recognize was uh, how important body language is in cultural exchanges in Asia. I was doing so much business across Pan-Asia and uh, for example, I don't speak Korean, but all my Korean partners thought that I spoke Korean because I could interpret when they were misunderstanding things through a translator very, very easily. And I think it's a skill that I built over time was just um, being able to read body language and people's, uh, people's understanding of a situation emotionally. And I realized in COVID, you're very much like looking at a camera. There is no body language really emotionally on, on cameras or not as much, I should say. I think I've gone through a lot of cultural learnings, particularly uh, when I first got here, it was, it was very much about being relatable. And then I think through COVID, it became um, more about being self-aware and understanding um, how you're adaptable from an online environment to an offline environment, and then rebuilding that again. So going back into an ecosystem, I noticed even going back to social functions post COVID and coming, you know, coming out to a new normal, I found sometimes that it was quite exhausting to be around people in, <laughs> in a post COVID world because there's so much energy that you're putting out that you weren't, you didn't have to, to, to necessarily do for two years. Is there anything specific in body language? Like let's say for Singaporeans, like they do something differently that Americans don't do. And you're like, ah, I know what, what, what it means now. I certainly think the way that people answer questions, particularly in a business environment, um, whether it's short form, redirected, or, they, or whether or not they ask questions. Because there's different types of circumstances that body language would indicate something. So a lot of times if somebody's confused, obviously that's probably one of the easier ones is they're, they're gonna ask a question to clarify. Uh, but in Asia, a lot of times people, for a variety of reasons, might culturally feel it's not um, appropriate to ask a question or maybe they don't wanna lose face by asking a question. And so uh, helping guide people through that process when you can identify the body language suggesting they're, they, might, they may be confused about something is, is a very delicate process of ensuring that you don't uh, embarrass someone in, a, in front of their colleagues or um, yeah. isolate, make them feel isolated in a situation, but rather create an ecosystem for a group to help understand what things are like and vice versa. Uh, I learned so much about culture. Being as outgoing as I am, I have to sometimes remind myself that it, it, you know, it might, be, might be less appropriate for me to ask questions in an environment as well. Is there anything that you miss from the US? I really miss sports. Um, Singapore's not a dynamic sports nation. When we talk about sports, my wife is an LA Dodgers fan. Um, I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. She thought that LA fans were real sports fans. Now that she's been married to somebody from Chicago, she understands that that's not true. <laughs> Uh, so when she sees this, she'll love that. Yeah. Um, but legitimately, she'd come home and she would say, you guys listen to sports talk radio? Yeah. You guys just constantly are obsessed. It's like a religion. And so yeah. when I grew up, that was my religion was sports. And I desperately miss the, the, the cultural connection with other Americans about sport. If you look at what Singapore has developed as a country and Lee Kuan Yew, instituted when he built this country. They instituted a policy of how they were gonna, how they were gonna marry various religions, various races, cultures of all different diversities and backgrounds together. And I think in the United States, we're, we're certainly good at, at that to a degree. We're also battling that on a lot of levels as well. There's a fine balance that I love about Asia. There's a mentality that individual freedoms and community good, there's a fine line between where those two coexist and where they break. I think that was absolutely something that I grew up with as a Midwestern kid. And I also think is starting to separate in the United States. And I'd love to see that come back together. I see that every day in Asia. I think Asian societies are very good about that line of individual freedom versus community good. And uh, that's something I'd, I, I would really appreciate. Can you name any differences that you remember that was different in Singapore 11 years back? The landscape. I mean, just simply buildings and infrastructure, property development. Uh, I think Changi only had three terminals. Now it's going on Terminal 5. I love to support small business. And that's been a big change in Singapore. There's, there's a, a huge emphasis on a lot of, uh, you know, major corporations and businesses that are, are able to enter this market. I have quite a few friends whose fathers were uh, you know, hawker uh, owners, food stall owners, or um, electricians, yeah. things that are, are hand, you know, um, uh, are really industry driven and, and trades, trade work, yeah. um, I think are, are things that are obviously disappearing 
um, as a service industry here. What could you say or do in the US and it would be appropriate, but then if you do it like in Singapore or in Asia, it would be like, no, no. I was in Australia last week with a couple Singaporean colleagues and they were fascinated by the idea of protesters, which I thought as an American is hilarious. Like, I really hope you can edit in the Viking guy taking over the Capitol building. I marched right by the protesters, had no awareness. I, I mean, I looked at it. Okay, they're protesting about something. I carry on with my day. But my Singaporean colleagues were like, you know, it's against the law basically to protest there. You, you have to go apply for a permit and explain why you're going to protest in Hanglin Park in Singapore. This is the uh, Korean embassy, North right. Korean embassy. What do you feel looking at it? Confused because I really would have loved to see Kim Jong Un if he was here a couple of years ago in my neighborhood. <laughs> It actually doesn't look like an embassy. It looks like a, just a normal yeah, house. Look at the little plaque. Yeah, I see the plate, but it's I also, like... I also want to know who they approved to live in the alley down, down the side. They must think that I'm like a, a U.S. spy or something because yeah. uh, I walk the dog past here every day. I see the flag. Yeah, it's hiding behind this giant tree. <laughs> but funny. It's, it's pretty crazy, actually. I mean, it's genuinely crazy. It's in this tiny little neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> You actually, you, you, you don't expect like walking around this, this particular neighborhood to see the no. North Korean embassy. Nuts. Funny. Yeah. Why the Singapore is still not the top place for like musicians, for shows in this region? Oh, I think, I think it is. I think it is a top, a top. Okay. I think it's a regular stop now. I think okay. what we're going to experience is we're going through an evolution of uh, what the expectations are in this local market as well, right? So a lot of shows might have a bigger set in Australia, for example, and then all of a sudden you might see a reduced set in Singapore. Mm. And so as the, as the economies of scale grow, you're going to start to see that also the, so do the opportunities for, um, for the development of the industry. Yeah. So, you know, with the National Stadium, you're seeing a lot more Western acts come in. You're seeing a lot of companies like Live Nation, AEG, move their headquarters to this, this part of the world, uh, well, actually to Singapore. Um, you know, they've invested in there's more venues in Singapore than <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> it feels like. Um, so it's a, it's a really robust market. Uh, it's just you're also limited based on population um, density. What's the biggest things normally that would be successful in Singapore? You'll see huge success and demand for something like the Lion King, which has come through Marina Bay Sands twice. Yeah. But then JJ Lin, uh, Jay Chow, um, any K-pop show. <laughs> yeah. show. So it really, it depends. You'll see a lot of crossover. Yeah, we can cross this way. You'll see a lot of crossover audience members who will go to a Western show and a, a Korean or uh, Cantonese artist. So you'll, you'll see a lot of crossover in those audience profiles in Singapore, which is quite, quite unique to this market. What's the features of Singaporean audience? What's Singaporeans like and what expats live in Singapore like? It depends on the artist. Like, uh, give me examples. Age like, group. What's, what's, what's... Back, Backstreet Boys is a good, Boys, good, good yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, so Backstreet Boys just comes, they sell out, hottest ticket in Singapore. Uh -huh. um, they were here a couple of years ago, uh, high demand um, and sold out, but you know, it was, it was probably easier to try to find a ticket. Um, mm. This year, impossible. I can't send my wife. I'm sorry, sweetheart. But then there's some weird ones like David Foster. Mm. David Foster's huge. Mm. He just is always here. He's got like, I, he was playing like three concerts a year oh, yeah. all the time when I was. <laughs> yeah, was, I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> No offense, David Foster, it wasn't a shot. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about one championship. Why yeah. it's so big and so popular in Singapore? Not just Singapore. I think they're broadcasting now in 160 countries worldwide. I think what makes it special is really the diversity of what they offer. You know, if you look at something like the UFC, um, UFC is a great product. They've built something very special. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're virtually a single product. They're a mixed martial arts organization in a sense of mixed martial arts, not Muay Thai. They don't have other arts and disciplines of martial arts. Um, I, I'm fascinated by Muay Thai. Mm. Uh, I think it's just one of the coolest sports in the world. Um, and a lot of that comes from the heritage of, uh, and the cultural background of, of what it means and mm. how much it means to, to the athletes who fight in Muay Thai. So they're now into grappling. They have incredible jujitsu. In every way, it's different than the UFC. The UFC is very much tabloid style marketing campaign, right? There yeah. are, in, in a non-disrespectful way, because I used to work in the circus, it's a circus promotion. It's using every stunt, every reality TV style marketing tool that you can have to drum up people who, it's clickbait, right? Mm. And, uh, and they want to create things that people are going to drive viewership so that they yeah. can garner views and sell sponsorship and the ecosystem evolves, right? 
Uh, that's what we do here on this platform. As that's well. right. Yeah. <laughs> Drive clicks. Insert here. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe. If you like this video, check out the next one. But you have only five seconds. Four, three, two, one.